Well, I'll answer that by saying how his work arrived in London in, well, the 90s, I suppose. The 9H Gallery, which was run by Wilfried Wang and Ricky Burdett, had a series of very beautiful exhibitions. And the one that I remember most was by Alvaro Cesar. And it showed the drawings of the School of Architecture in Oporto. And I can say that for a certain uh, type of architect in London, it changed everything, almost overnight. We had been looking at good architects in London and America um, whose work was um, about architecture, you know. And suddenly there was an architect in the form of Caesar whose work spoke about cultural issues in a way similar to literature or painting, but in a specifically architectural way. So, the, I, almost immediately I went to a port, I came to a porto here to see the buildings. And I was designing the Listen Gallery in London, which was made in 1992. So I can't remember the exact sequence of when I saw Caesar. But I saw the swimming pool at Lesa, and I understood something about how I saw his work, which was that that building in Lesa makes relationships with the dock and the water and the edge of the road. This is how I see it. Um, so that when you go in, you go below the road, you leave the world behind you and you change. You change your clothes and you become less a human being identified by your clothes and you become more naked and then you leave and you expect that you'll see the sea but you don't, you're turned and then then you discover the sea by this route and eventually you're in the pool by the sea and you're more like a sea animal on the other side of the rocks um, so this was uh, a revelation for me and these were, this is what I saw. And then, sometime later, Alvaro Cesar gave a lecture in London. And with some uh, trepidation, I asked him a question, which I'd prepared about the swimming pool. And he did what all intelligent architects do. He ignored my question and answered a question that he'd formulated in his own mind. And he said, when I was young, I confused nature with architecture, but now I don't. So I, I don't know what to make of that. <laughs> but then I, on that same trip, I went to see the bank at Villa de Conde. And what I liked so much about that project was the way that it uh, again, had, to my eye, uh, visual relationships with uh, things in the city like the aqueduct in its shape and the, the sort of rhyming of parts of Caesar's building with the surroundings. Unconscious, I think. And I, I learned something, well, I did I learn something. Something occurred in my thoughts from seeing Caesar's work, which was that that as an architect you see things, but you also notice things, and it's in this outside of your vision where you capture uh, qualities in the location of your building which somehow play themselves out in the decisions that you make unconsciously about doing this and not that, and this and not that. You end up with a, if you're thinking in that way, you end up with a, a work which um, you, in which you discover all sorts of qualities that you didn't think you put there. So when I made the Listen Gallery in 1992, when I came back to look at it, I realized that the view from the building was a, I won't say a commentary, but a connection with London. And London is made very carelessly, like many cities. And 
the building that I made just frames it and says, this is what we did. This is how our culture operates. And to understand my own building that way, I understood it through my experience of uh, Caesar's work. And in Villa de Conde, what struck me was that in this market town, the people working in the bank and the people coming into the bank to give money would might very well be from the same community. And all that divided them was a, a counter. You know, they were in one space. But it does this marvelous thing, and I'm, perhaps these would not agree with this, but the glass and the ground floor, it reflects the town, and as you walk around it starts to reflect the, the country. And in all those towns, the, the buildings are very narrow with a space between them, and then there's the street in front of the building, and back in the distance there's the country, and so it makes this transition between the country, among the many other things that it does. So these were the things that I learned from Caesar, and I still do. Um, well, I, my friend, Mark Pimlot, and I came to Oporto with our students, and we saw the School of Architecture when the small pavilion, the Antonio, whatever it is, pavilion, was made, and then the other buildings were in concrete. And the buildings in concrete were like Louis Kahn or something. You know, you looked at them with just amazement. But the pavilion was particularly lovely because in its three sides it places three groups of students privately, and yet they look across the courtyard to each other. And the courtyard is closes like that, so the view is compressed. There's a psychological dimension to this. Um, and then, in some of the parts, there's a window which gives a view of the bridge. So as a young architecture student, you're designing away, and you look out the window and you see what eventually you will produce. So it's a miracle of um, perceptive encouragement. And uh, what also struck me about that building is that it's how it's placed in the garden, because you come in and you see the original house, but it's not in the classical manner, it's not directly face on. It, you see it at an angle, and you see the pavilion at an angle, and you're encouraged to walk around the back of it, and you, then you see the smaller building that he converted, and then you walk underneath the building, a sort of beautiful mistake, you know, where suddenly the building is chopped. And then you see a window and you see into the studio and then it's taken away and then you go to an entrance. And so it's in a very small building. It's, um, drama is the wrong word, it's not dramatic, it's um, placemaking in the highest sense because it has a, an understandable psychological dimension. It's very, Caesar's work is very unlike other architects of status who will often promote themselves to an ideological or a rhetorical position. And those designers, like Rem, who's a great designer, they, in a way, they become part of the commodification of architecture and the commodification of theory. Caesar's always been encouraging because he just makes buildings and the buildings are much more everything goes into the building and everything comes out of the building to the person that experiences them. That's the big difference between the two camps of architecture. The one that is driven to say things that clients can take away and those that make architecture where over a long period of time, it gives something back. And Caesar has that ability, that second ability.